What shall I feed my baby? When shall I feed my baby? What shall I feed my toddler? When shall I feed my toddler? These are questions that all parents have and they are very important questions because the way the baby is fed, the way the toddler is fed, really lays down the tissue, the cellular, the bone foundation for the rest of, rest of their lives. Hippocrates, the father of all medicine, said, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. But it is a subject that, he, that does not, I believe, receive the importance that it should receive. A lot of time is spent on what toys, what colour coding in the child's bedroom, but the food that the child eats is of the most importance. And I know, ladies, that's why you're here to hear this lecture today, is to get some clarity on this subject. What I'd like to begin with now is I'd like to begin with the mother because believe it or not it's in utero and it's actually even the mother's lifestyle habits even before she conceived that has a lot to do plays a major part in the health status of the baby and how the baby grows. Now let's have a have a look for instance at the gut. You see, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, said, let medicine be your food and food be your medicine. But he said another oft quoted subject or statement, not quoted nearly as much as let food be your medicine and medicine be your food, but he said all disease begins in the gut. The gastrointestinal tract is what he is referring to. The gastrointestinal tract is about an eight metre tube in an adult human being. And it is a hollow tube. And anything that goes into that hollow tube is not part of you or me or baby until it gets broken down into tiny little substances and then absorbed into the blood. The blood is often called the life of the flesh or the river of life because the blood carries the nutrients to every part of the body. But it is in the gut that the breakdown of the food happens. And so nutrients in the blood, which are feeding every cell, are dependent on the proper function of the gut to break down that food into tiny substances. Now the gut is an interesting part of the human body because as, as, as I said, even though whatever goes in there is not part of you until it gets broken down, the, the gut performing properly is essential for the food to be broken down. Now let me give a little illustration of what the gut looks like. This is starting from the gastrointestinal tract area of the small intestine because it's the small intestine where most absorption happens. So the lining of the gut basically looks like this and these are called little villi and over the villi is the blood little blood capillary network. You see the food is coming down here, it gets broken down by enzymes at different part in the gut and when it gets broken down to the tiny substance called glucose, then it can get absorbed into the blood. But lining the gastrointestinal tract is a thick layer of turf made out of lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium, so healthy bacteria. So it's this thick layer of turf that is lining this gastrointestinal tract and it's made out basically of bacteria or healthy bacteria. And the role of that bacteria is protection. Protection is very important because as I said, everything that goes down this gastrointestinal tract is not part of you till it gets broken down. And some things are coming down that gut that should not go into the blood. And so God designed the human body with this turf to play a protective role. But it not only plays a protective role, it is also important for absorption. So even though there are enzymes in the mouth, there are enzymes in the stomach that are breaking down food. The final touch of breakdown is happening in this thick wall or turf of bacteria. When a baby is in utero, that baby has a sterile gut. That sterile gut is referring to the fact that there is no bacterial wall. 
and the baby takes on that bacterial wall, that healthy or friendly flora, as the baby goes through the birth canal of the mother. And so can you see that understanding this is very important for the mother to have a correct, a correct uh, balance of microbes in her gut. Now what would interfere with this? What would interfere with this would be if the mother is a regular partaker of antibiotics. You've probably heard of antibiotics. Antibiotics have saved probably millions of lives so far. And antibiotics kill bacteria. And if a person's dying of a very severe lung infection and a strong dose of antibiotics is given to wipe out that bacteria, it can certainly save the life. But problem happening in society today is people have lost the simple ways of treating a cold or a flu. They've forgotten about taking garlic and having lemon and honey drinks and going to bed and giving their body the right conditions for healing. Many people are so fast and have so much pressure on them to make sure that the payment for the house goes in the bank, etc, etc. And so they take different drugs to sub to suppress the symptoms and they keep going to work. Am I right? <laughs> this is happening. Whereas, did you know that a cold is a house clean? It's basically the body saying, can you just stop for a day? Can you just go to bed for a day? Can you stop eating for a day? Can you have lots of water? Maybe put your feet in hot water with a bit of mustard. Remember those old remedies grandma had? And the people want to keep going. And so they take the antibiotics. And antibiotics are being used too frequently. And many people I meet are having maybe two or three courses every year. And little by little, this is coming in, not only to kill off the bacteria in the, in the chest, which probably would have killed, been killed off very nicely by the body's own immune system and maybe a good dose of garlic, but it's also killing off, in part, this border protection. I call it border protection. And also, it is compromising the ability for fine, uh, final absorption. But let's have a look at a woman who's had a couple of doses of antibiotics maybe every year. By the way, did you know that the body can cope quite well with about two courses in a lifetime? And some people, I gave a meeting last night with 50 people, I said, put up your hand if you've never had an antibiotic. Not one hand went up. If my son James, who's 35, was in the audience, his hand would have gone up. Very unusual human being to have actually reached the age of 35 years and never had an antibiotic. And by the way, he's still alive. <laughs> and there's some of the things I'm going to touch on as we go through this meeting on some simple ways to, to help your child recover from simple ailments. But first of all, I wanted to lay a foundation. And we're having a look at the baby's gut flora as it's born. Let's say the mother has a cup, had a couple of doses of antibiotics every year. Her gut flora is getting compromised. Holes are eaten in that gut lining because of the um, antibiotics. Antibiotics can kill off unwanted bacteria, but they also kill off the good guys. They also kill off what's called the friendly or the healthy bacteria. And also, let's say the lady had uh, eczema, psoriasis, and she took cortisone. Cortisone is another drug that kills off the flora. And let's say the woman was on the pill, the contraceptive pill, for five years before she gave birth to her baby. That also interferes with gut flora. Can you see what's happening? And when the baby comes through the birth canal, the birth canal's flora is determined by the gut flora. So the baby is born with a compromised gut flora. Can you see where it's all starting? No wonder Hippocrates said all disease begins in the gut. Let's say a baby is born by caesarean section. How much gut flora is that baby getting? None. <laughs> I was talking to some midwives and they were surprised to hear me say that if a baby is born by caesarean section, then every morning the mother should paint a little lactobacillus acidophilus powder on her nipple. So the baby's getting a dose of that. Now, by the way, breast milk certainly will also put in some good, good gut flora. But can you see if the mother's gut flora is compromised, even her breast milk flora will be compromised. Now, on top of that, let's say the baby is not breastfed. 
Let's say the baby is given altered cow's milk and many formulas are altered cow's milk. And because they're dried powders, they really don't have that gut flora. And because they've been interfered with so much, and by the way, homogenize and pasteurize kills off any flora that may be in that milk. Now, pasteurization is happening to kill off uh, harmful pathogens in the milk. But if you ask the farmer, he will never give homogenize and pasteurize cow's milk to the baby calf because the baby calf will not live. And if the baby calf does live, the baby calf will not thrive. And yet many babies are being fed these compromised cow's milks, compromised, altered, because they've been altered, granted to kill off the harmful bacteria. But I have a friend who owns an organic dairy farm. And you go into his organic dairy, there is no smell. No smell, because he keeps it very clean. <laughs> If every dairy was clean, there would be no need for pasteurization. Can you see that? But my daughter in America, she was living opposite a dairy. And if you went past that dairy, oh, the smell. It was filthy. And sometimes those things that go on the udder would fall on the ground in the manure and the farmer would put it on the next udder. Now that milk has E. coli in it. That milk is a dangerous milk and it is not fit for human consumption unless it is pasteurized. Do you see that? <laughs> but the farm down the road is as neat as a pin. It is perfectly clean. But the, but the truck picks up the E. coli milk and the lovely clean milk and it all goes together. Can you see why pasteurization had to happen? Cow's milk's very good milk for, cow, for cows. <laughs> But you have a look at the size of a baby calf. It's far, far bigger than the size of a baby human. The, the milk that is closest to human milk is goat's milk. And I've met many babies, met many mothers who had healthy babies on the goat's milk. So, so if a mother cannot feed her baby, that would be the best option. But let's go back to gut flora. We're going on a journey of looking at this gut flora. So the baby's born with compromised gut flora. And then the baby is given altered cow's milk, which is not feeding this gut flora. And then at the age of two months, the baby is vaccinated. And the vaccination further compromises the gut flora. Now, if the baby is born with a strong gut flora, then vaccination doesn't knock it so badly. Can you see that? Some babies react badly to vaccination. Some babies don't react badly to vaccination. And you see it all comes back to gut flora. Now let's say at four months, the baby is given uh, cereal, rice cereal. Many, many mothers are told that. But did you know that it is all dependent on the teeth, the way digestion happens. The first teeth that a baby gets is four on the top and four on the bottom. And that my baby's got their teeth about seven and a half. They began at seven and a half. So maybe not those eight teeth, not all through till maybe eight or nine months of age. And those teeth are called milk teeth. Do you know why they're called milk teeth? Because that's all babies should have. Milk. <laughs> now they're tearing teeth. If a baby has anything, the baby just has little tastes. Some of my babies were interested in a little taste, some were not. What do you give a baby at that stage? You give a baby a little taste of apple. And an old, old thing to do, and I used to do it, I got it off my mother-in-law, you put a piece of apple in a little net bag and you tie it off. And the, it's, it's good for the baby's gums too. It helps those teeth to come to, through. But all they're really getting is they're sucking juice out of the apple. Or a celery stick. Or another really good one is eat off all the corn off a cob. And when all the corn's gone, give that to the baby. <laughs> and the baby will hold it, fits nicely into the hand and sucks. Notice, baby should not be doing any of this till the baby can sit. Digestion, have you ever tried eating a meal while you're lying on your back? <laughs> baby should be able to sit. When's that? About seven and a half months. Baby should be able to put to mouth around that age and baby should have some teeth. No teeth, no food. The equation is very simple. Now the next teeth that come through are the molars. They come through about here 
and the molars appear between 14 and 20 months of age. When Tylen appears, then something appears in the mouth, and this is a very important part of baby's digestion, Tylen. Tylen appears, and Tylen is an enzyme. It's an amylase that breaks down starch. So babies have no ability to break down starch until the molars are fully through and Tylen is now present in the mouth. And what's the mother told from many baby health centres? To give her baby Firax or rice cereal at four to six months of age. But the baby has no ability to digest or break down that starch till the molars are through. So let's go back to gut flora. Baby's born with a compromised gut flora. Baby is immunised. Baby is having compromised or a interfered with altered cow's milk and then baby is fed at four to six months with with a food that the baby cannot break down. Border protection's gone so what's starting to happen? Partially digested particles of that starch is now getting into the blood. The blood sees it as an enemy, the blood creates antibodies and those antibodies can create allergies so baby gets asthma Baby starts to get eczema. How many mothers have I spoken to that their babies are getting eczema when they're weaned off the breast? And when they're weaned off the breast, what do they have? Is the altered cow's milk? Or they start to feed them food. Now, many a mother goes to her baby health centre advisor and says to her, my baby's not sleeping through the night at six months of age. So the, so the woman will say, give your baby a little rice cereal every night before they go to bed. Do they sleep through the, through the night? They're knocked out. <laughs> They've got this lump in their gut that they're unable to digest. And then the mother noticed that the baby's breath's not very nice anymore. You see, it all gets back to this border protection. And sadly, babies with hugely compromised guts who've had no repair or rebuilding or repopulation of that gut flora and given the Farax too young and the altered cow's milk by the second or sometimes third vaccination, very sad that the baby dies or the baby gets autism or the baby gets epilepsy. Very, very sad. Dr. Andrew Wakefield is a British endocrinologist. Sorry, not an endocrinologist, a gastroenterologist. And he noticed that a lot of young children who were coming to him, even in their first year of life, with compromised gut. And why were they coming to see this gastroenterologist? Because the baby had almost non-stop diarrhoea or the baby was bringing up a lot of the milk. So what he did was he did a biopsy of the payer's patches. Now in our colon, this is your small intestine and it comes into your colon on your left side of your abdomen about where your appendix is. And then you've got your ascending colon, your transverse colon, and then your descending colon. Well, in the transverse colon, there's some lymphatic patches called Peyer's patches. And he did a biopsy of these patches and he found the MMR vaccine in every child. And he was surprised that this MMR vaccine seemed to be contributing to the compromised gut flora, the, the inability of the gut to digest properly. He also found that a lot of his patients, young children, were autistic. So he wrote an article in The Lancet implying very slightly that the MMR vaccine was a contributing factor to this comprom this, uh, these gut problems and also to autism. Well, I'm afraid the pharmaceutical companies rose up in arms because you see the implications. This man's a gastroenterologist. He's a doctor. He is not anti-vaccine. He was more pointing out when they are put together, they appear to, um, to cause a problem. The end result of that is he had to uh, extract his article from The Lancet. He lost all his credentials. Now, it wasn't just Dr. Andrew Wakefield. He had a whole team of pathologists. He's written a book. It's called Callous Disregard. Because of the callous disregard of the 
medical profession, pharmaceutical companies to just have a look <laughs> at combining these three together. I need to mention this at this point. My, my talk is not on vaccination, but I need to show you the link that's coming in because it is true that many babies are vaccinated and don't get autism and don't, have the comp don't get the gut problems. And I would like to suggest that a lot of it has to do with the mother's history of this gut flora because a nice healthy gut flora it's designed by God to be able to withstand a little bit of beating it's your border protection and it's your final absorption the more people I meet the more people I help with health I am more and more convinced that what's happening in our bodies in our babies our children's bodies it's not just one thing sometimes when a problem happens it's the final straw You've heard about the straw that broke the camel's back. It's just the final straw on a whole lot of little things starting before even baby's born. And you also, are, I'm sure, realise the saying, education is power. And many parents at this stage are feeling terrible. <laughs> oh, what have I done to my baby? But I've got some good news. There's a verse in the Bible. It's found in Acts 17, verse 30, and it says, God winks at our ignorance. So should we. <laughs> because you cannot be held accountable if you thought you were doing the best by your baby and yet you were doing in ignorance. The only hope of better things on planet Earth, I believe, is the education of people in right principles. And I'm so happy to see mothers in front of me here because if the mothers are educated, now they start to know how to build the, the health and the strength of their children. I was talking to a man on the phone only yesterday and he has terrible gut problems. And where do you think I started? Way back. Sadly, his mother has passed away. But most mothers of that era, because his mother was a baby boomer, and it was the baby boomers that first used the pill, the contraceptive pill. So if the mother's on the pill, and by the way, why, why would a human being have a course of antibiotics twice every year? Usually because of sinus problems, usually because of a congested chest, maybe it's a asthma, maybe it's bronchitis. They are, usually, they are the common forms. Or... Often in children is ear problems. Newton's third law of motion states that to every action there is an equal and an opposite reaction. Why? We always need to look at why. When a person has excess mucus, constantly blowing nose, the eustachian tubes, which are the tubes that link your eyes and your nose and your mouth and your ear, often called the eustachian tubes. When, when interference is happening in there because of excess mucus, there's the ear problems, there's the sinus problems, there's the blowing of the nose, the chest problems. Why has that been caused? It's usually an allergy. And the most common allergens are dairy. I was reading one newspaper article that was showing a research in Australia that state that 60% of Australians can't handle cow's milk. Now the cow has five stomachs and at the end of those five stomachs there's a substance that's very, very similar to yogurt and feta cheese. <laughs> so if a, if a human being wants to eat dairy, they are really the two ways that it should be eaten. And lactose, which is what the allergy usually is to, if the feta cheese and the yogurt is well made, there is no lactose left. It's the milk sugar because the culturing process has broken that all down to a substance. This is fairly easily to digest. One lady said to me, well, what milk do you drink, Barbara? I said to her, I'm weaned. I'm an adult with teeth. I eat food. <laughs> you see, milk is for babies and cow's milk is for baby cows and human milk is for baby humans. But granted, not every mother is able to feed her, her baby. If a mother really wants to, she can, she can contact the Australian Breastfeeding Association, ABA, and they are, have wonderful helpers in helping women to breastfeed. So number one allergens is dairy products. Whenever I look, particularly at a little Aboriginal child, and there are quite a few that living around our, 
round our way with green coming out of their nose, they're a little bit extra on the weight and they've got a chesty cough and they're pulling at their ears. You know what I say? There's a cow's milk baby. There's a cow's milk baby. I, read, I met a lady one day, she said, I could not feed my baby. She was in her 60s. She said, the doctor tested my milk. It was thin and it was blue. What is she comparing it to? What is he comparing it to? Cow's milk, which is rich and thick and produces that rich, thick mucus, especially the green stuff. <laughs> Do you know that milk is perfect for the needs of a human baby? So dairy is a very common allergen. Don't we need milk for our calcium? Well, the orangutans and the elephants and the giraffes and the apes, where do they get their calcium from? Greens. <laughs> You see that a cow can access, a baby calf can access the calcium from the mother's milk because it's got five stomachs to break it down and make it into a, into a form that is accessible. But did you know that the countries in this world that consume the highest amounts of dairy products have the highest incidence of osteoporosis? It is not true that cow's milk will deliver a good form of calcium. It is a form of calcium that's very difficult for the human body to access. So dairy is a very common allergen. The other common allergen is wheat. And, and many cereals that babies are given are, are wheat. Some mothers have told me they soften wheat bix with milk to give it to their baby. Then the baby's getting the two allergens. Now the, God, the wheat that God created was called emma, emma wheat. And the protein or the gluten structure of the emma wheat is very fragile. And it's good that it's fragile because our gut can easily break it down. But in the 1950s, wheat was hybridized in Mexico. It was hybridized and this hybridized wheat it didn't grow as tall, only about this tall. It produced grain a lot quicker and it almost doubled the yield of the grain. And they hybridized the wheat so that it produce, would produce more wheat so that the starvation problem in Mexico could be solved and it solved it. And no one complains about that. In fact, a Nobel Prize was received by the researchers that did it. But the problem arose in the 1970s when that hybridized wheat grain went all over the world. And that hybridized wheat grain has a very complex structure. Complex structure means a lot more difficult for the gut to break down. Now if the gut looks like this, can you see what's happening with this? It's barely able to be broken down. So, board, and border protection is compromised. And so, partially digested parts of this wheat grain is getting into the blood. And so, the white blood cells produce more eosinophils, which are a special type of white blood cell designed to deal with these remnants of the partially broken down grain. And when high eosinophils are present, you see eosinophil has histamine in it. So when high in eosinophil is in the blood, you get high histamine. And high histamine spells allergy. And that's the sinus, that's the hay fever, that's the, the congested chest. Some people, I find, get irritable bowel disease. Some people get eczema. Some people get constipation. All of these things are caused because of this hybridized wheat ground. Now, some people can handle wheat. Can you see they are the people with strong border protection in place? It is this hybridized wheat that is causing the problems. And if a mother rings me up and she my, says, my baby has eczema, I said to her, is your baby eating food? No, my baby's only six, seven months of age and I've heard your message on don't give the baby food until they have a good set of teeth. But my baby still has eczema. And so then I went to the mother's diet and I find the mother's eating a high dairy, lots of sandwiches, toast, wheat cereals. I said, aha. I said, you need to be stopping all wheat. You need to be stopping. And of course, you look at in society today, how many people eat cereal and toast for breakfast, sandwiches for lunch, pasta for tea. That's almost 100% wheat diet, isn't it? 
So I say to the mother, you've got to stop all wheat. And if the mother says, oh, no, I can't do that. I love wheat. So then I say, well, maybe you need to put your baby on goat's milk. It's, it's, it's just a decision a mother has to be made. Some mothers choose to change their diet. Some mothers choose to put the baby on goat's milk. It's a personal choice. In fact, I've seen babies' skin clear up in three weeks. In only three weeks after eliminating, eliminating the most common allergens. Now, there are two other grains that don't have quite as complex or high gluten structure, and that is barley and oats. But if there's a suspected allergy, my suggestion is stop them all for a few months. It will take about four months for your next set of white blood cells to be totally made, so the symptoms may not subside for a few weeks. And then, maybe after a couple of months, introduce oats and just observe. Maybe introduce barley one at a time and observe. You see, your body's very, very faithful. I believe everyone should be their own doctor because only you know how you feel, only you know how different things react in your body. And the mother should be the doctor of her baby because no one knows her baby like her mother. I can remember spending hours just gazing at my baby. I knew every eyelash. I knew every little crease of the mouth. Every mother does. <laughs> and, your, and the mother knows if her baby's not right. Isn't that true? So the, the mother is the best guide. And so I like to use the process of elimination. Let's try this. Let's try this. Let's try this. And you watch your baby's response to know whether the baby is, uh, whether, whether it's working with your baby. You see, the best guide if your baby is doing well is your baby is happy, your baby has lots of wet nappies, and your baby is a nice, comfortable size. Some babies are slight, some babies are big. <laughs> so, what grain could we have? Have you heard of spelt? Spelt is a wild hybrid or a field hybrid of the original Emma wheat grain. And that field hybrid has the gentle structure. And if that spelt flour is made into sourdough bread, Sourdough bread should really be called cultured bread because it is certainly not sour. But what sourdough bread does, it's a cultured bread and it has, contains lactobacillus acidophilus and bifidus bacterium and wild yeast. And it breaks down that protein or that gluten structure in the grain. And so when the person eats the spelt sourdough bread, it breaks down the structure so it's even more fragile. And fragile is good news because that fragile structure is easily broken down in our gastrointestinal tract. My suggestion is any baby that has eczema or asthma, they're two very common allergens that a baby has, that initially the mother even cut out all of these and have gluten-free grains like rice, like uh, buckwheat, the Polish no buckwheat. Another one is... Um, Quinoa, you familiar with quinoa? It's spelled quinoa. Another one is uh, polenta, amarath, millet. Millet is a very nice alternative to oat porridge. We, we serve these other grains at our health retreat. At our health retreat, we don't serve any gluten at all. Some things we might do a little spelt flour, but we might use ground walnuts or something like that to spread it out. This explains why so many babies are having this sickness. So how can we strengthen our babies? How can we get their immune system up? And as you can see, getting the immune system up means we've got to repair this gut wall. If you don't turn the tap off, you're still going to be mopping up in the other corner. I suggest all mothers make their babies dairy-free and gluten-free. And as the baby gets strong, you know, because you've got a happy baby, if your baby's not happy, there's something wrong. <laughs> now, obviously, your baby's hungry and you don't tend your baby, your baby's going to get very unhappy. So you know what I mean, within reason. 
So how do we repair that gut wall? Let's make a list. Number one, eliminate. Eliminate the common allergens. The third common allergen is refined sugar. When you have compromised gut flora, when your lactobacillus acidophilus is compromised, then the yeast that lives in the gut can get out of control, namely Candida albicans. There are dozens of different species of Candida. One lady said, I've got Candida in my body. I said, we all have. <laughs> it's only a problem when it gets out of control and it gets out of control when your border protection is compromised. And if your yeast is getting out of control and the mother or the baby or the human being is having large sugar, what's that going to do to Candida yeast? It's going to cause it to multiply. And how quickly does yeast spread rise? Half an hour. <laughs> So when given the right um, conditions, it can multiply very quickly. So number one, we must eliminate the known allergens. Number two, repopulate. Repopulate with a probiotic substance or a, a probiotic supplement. And you can get probiotics for babies. Now, if a woman has given birth to a baby with compromised gut flora, the mother needs to get her, get her gut populated too, repopulated with the good guys. Flood the gastrointestinal tract with the good guys and that will bring the so-called bad gals back under control. You see, candida has a place in the gut. It has a place in the way the food is broken down. I liken candida to water and fire, good slave but a bad master. It must be brought back under control and flooding the gastrointestinal tract with a probiotic. What does, a, what does the word probiotic mean? It means for life. Now the third is repair. How do we repair? There are two herbs that a baby can easily take, even a newborn baby. And these two herbs are mucousy in their nature, and so they coat and soothe and heal the gastrointestinal tract. And these two herbs contain growth stimulating properties. So they can repair this gut very quickly. One is aloe vera. And I think we're all familiar with aloe vera. <laughs> now the part of the aloe vera plant that you use is the inside clear gel. Just under the skin is a yellow substance. And if you take that, you will go to the toilet big time. <laughs> it is irritating to the gut. But if you thickly peel the aloe vera and just get the clear white scent or the clear gel center, you can do it in a few ways. If you're giving it to baby, what I would often do is I would put it in my mouth and I would chew it up to a gel, spit it into my fingers and then just pop it into baby's mouth. Now not everyone's happy to do that, but do you know traditionally a hundred years ago that was very common <laughs> to do that. And you're also putting a little a bit of your good bacteria back into that baby. Most of your good bacteria is on your gut, but you've got a little bit in your mouth. Or you can just mash it up with a fork or you can get aloe vera juice. Now aloe vera juice is a stabilized juice. Just be cautious that it doesn't have sugar in it and I think you can get it with some juices. Obviously if it's a new little baby you just give it little tiny bits, you know even just a few drops for a, a very tiny baby. And the other is slippery elm. Slippery elm is the powdered bark of the slippery elm tree. It is an American tree. And when you buy it, it's like a fluffy powder. It just looks like the powdered bark of a tree. And when you put water with it, it goes like a, a thick jelly. If it, you put water with, more water with it, of course it thins it out a little bit. And this is an excellent herb for baby. It'll coat and soothe the gut if the baby has colic. By the way, no baby would have colic 
if the mother eliminated all of this out of her diet. And the Australian Breastfeeding Association, they are big pushers for that as well. How nice if a baby doesn't have colic, eh? And if the baby has colic and you've got a baby who's two months old and you've just found this out and it's going to take a month for your body to adjust to having this out, the good news is you can give your little one a bit of slippery elm every night. You can mix it with a bit of uh, breast milk and just uh, pop it into their mouth, just a little bit of a finger putting it in and put even put the slippery elm in in a little lump mix with a bit of milk and then quickly put the baby on the breast and then the, the swallowing action will take it down. Um, you can put a little extra fluid in it and make it more watery and even put it in a little syringe and squirt it down the side of the baby's mouth. You'll find, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. You'll find ways to, to get it in with your baby. Now, if the baby has an upset stomach, this certainly can help, but there is something else that I call the baby herb. I believe God designed this for baby. It's chamomile. And chamomile has two main actions on the human body. It is a mild sedative. That sounds attractive, doesn't it, when baby's upset? It is a mild sedative, but chamomile also is calming on the gut. It's calming on the gut. It doesn't quite do the repair that these two do, but it, it is a very calming herb for a little one. My fifth baby, no, sorry, it was my fourth baby, was a home birth, and she was a very large baby. She was 10 pound, and as you can see, I'm not a very large lady. And there was a little bit of a squeeze to get her out. And when she was born, she had marks on her, on, on her forehead as if it had been a little bit of a squeeze for her. Now, my little Julia baby, she cried a lot. And usually if it's a slightly traumatic birth, you will find that. And my little baby had to be held nearly all the time. If I wasn't holding her, someone else would. And I got her a dummy. <laughs> because when a baby sucks a dummy, it relaxes them. And every time I put the dummy in her mouth, I dip it in a bowl of chamomile tea. And so over the day, she's getting lots of drops of chamomile tea. And I found that the chamomile tea reduced her, her crying by about half. She didn't cry nonstop because I held her, <laughs> but she, she was not a happy baby. But the chamomile tea made a huge difference. By the way, at the age of three months, a smile came on her face and the smile hardly ever went away. Let's fast forward and she's 18 years old and she went into a restaurant to apply for a wait to be a waitress. And they don't usually give a waitress a job as a waitress unless she's had experience and she had had no experience. And the interviewer said to her, you've got no experience but you haven't stopped smiling since you've sat in front of me so you've got the job. <laughs> Just a, li a little story on, uh, uh, on, on the mood. If baby's not happy, there is something wrong. I remember my, uh, she's my third daughter. I didn't hear her cry for months. <laughs> you know, that should be. You know, the mother can tell the baby's getting a little bit upset, so the mother picks it up. Oh, she needs a nappy change. Oh, she needs um, a feed. Now, notice one of the first things I said to you was, when, what shall I feed my baby? And when shall I feed my baby? So first of all, we're looking at what shall I feed my baby. I'll define that and then I want to define when to feed the baby. So by showing you the things that to eliminate, by discussing with you the teeth issue, my suggestion is baby should not be fed food, only maybe little tastes in the latter part of their first year of life. And then when the molars appear, little by little, you can start to introduce things. But the best first foods are really fruits and vegetables. Now, I never made baby food, ever. People used to say to me, it's all right, Barbara, just mash it up if they haven't got teeth and just scoop it into their mouth. And what, what happens? It just comes straight back out. That's because the tongue and the bottom lip come together to suck. So when you put a bit of food in that baby's mouth, the tongue and the top lip come together and what happens to the food? <laughs> What's the baby telling you? They're not ready for that food. And mother used to say, it's all right, Barbara, just scoop it up and keep poking it back in. Do you know the baby's telling you it is not ready for food? 
a lady rang me up and she said, my baby's 10 months of old, I'm getting age, I'm getting so much pressure to feed my baby food, but my baby doesn't want it. I said, listen to the baby. Now, if the baby is very hungry and you don't give the baby milk, certainly it'll take anything you give it. But when a mother is introducing food, she should never give the baby food unless the baby has a tummy full of milk. The, ba the milk is the best. The baby has a tummy full of milk and if they're interested in a little bit, maybe give them a little bit of a taste. When the molars appear, you can start giving a little bit more. Now, when I gave my babies vegetables, I would put them in the high chair. Remember, they can sit, they can do it themselves. I would give them a half steamed carrot stick. I would give them a slightly steamed broccoli head, a slightly steamed maybe cauliflower head and let them see the colour. Let them feel the texture. Because if baby receives mush, they don't ever develop a taste for the different colours, the different textures and the different foods. And the first foods I always gave my baby were raw foods. They would suck on a carrot, they would suck on a celery stick, they would um, have a little bit of apple in that net cloth. Apparently you can even buy little net cloths. <laughs> Some people just cut off the end of a pantyhose and stick it in there and, and, um, and do it like that way. But you may have heard of that some way. But my son James, who's 35 today, he did not eat any food till he was 16 months of age. He was not interested, just not interested. What's baby saying? I don't need it. He was a good size. He was a bright, happy little boy. Why do they need it? At 16 months of age, he began to get a little bit of interest. My son James is built like this today. He's a bit of a bodybuilder, just part time. His, um, his biceps are about the size of my thighs. <laughs> He's a project manager. He has his own business. So obviously, this boy who ate no food till he was 16 months old has a strong body, all his own teeth. And he's a smart guy, he's a master builder. In other words, it's giving all the nourishment needed for a healthy body and a healthy brain. I was so concerned when I read an article in a paper by a pediatrician who said, if you feed your baby at a younger age, they will be smarter. There is no research to prove that. And feeding babies food has only been done really in about the last hundred years. Before then, babies never had food. My daughter Emma, she lives in America. She has twin girls. She has five children, but two of them are twin girls. They're nine now. At the age of 16 months of age, they were running around the room and they had never tasted food. Never even tasted food. When they sat at the table and everyone ate, they had blocks and wooden spoons and things to chew on. And they thought they were doing what we were doing. Once your baby's tasted food, they're going to want more. <laughs> So that's why be cautious with the introduction of food. One lady said, but my baby's grabbing everything to put it in their mouth. I said, they'll put their big toes in their mouth. If the caterpillar is crawling along, they'll put a caterpillar in the mouth. They don't know. <laughs> they test everything by their mouth, have you noticed? So that is not a good guide. And so when shall you feed your baby? Your baby's stomach needs a rest. I tried never to feed my baby under three hours. Some babies are happy with three hours. Some babies are happy with four hours. What I would do is I would do everything. I would distract my baby, walk with my baby to try and go the distance. Now, if my baby had a cold and was miserable, sometimes I'd go to two hourly. <laughs> if my milk seemed a little bit low of an evening, I might go to even a one and a half hour, but it was just a short period of time to build that milk up. The Australian Breastfeeding Association has excellent counsellors that can guide you in all of these things. But when babies fed hourly or half hourly, that can really irritate the stomach. It, the baby needs times of rest. When do you feed your toddler? Feed your toddler at meal times. I would feed my toddler breakfast, then I would feed my toddler lunch, and then I would have them a little bit at night. If toddlers are eating all day long, they never eat a good meal, their stomach gets irritated. And and then, and you've got an irritated little one whose stomach's always irritated. You see, it takes three and a half to four hours to digest a meal. 
and then the stomach needs a little bit of a rest. And many toddlers say they're hungry when they're just bored. Many toddlers say they're hungry when they're actually thirsty. And how many times does a toddler cry and cry for food, you give it food, then they want to drink. <laughs> and yet drinking with the meals dilutes the gastric acid. So very important to do that. I raised eight children on this method and I had very happy children. What do you do when they're sick? When they're sick, I wouldn't feed my baby much. I would only do breast milk, even if my toddler by now is eating food. Maybe just watermelon. They need to eat lightly so all their body's energies go to healing. And the body can heal itself. One thing I might do when they had a chest cold was I might slice some garlic finely put it in a cloth and wrap it on the bottom of their feet. In about two minutes, you can smell garlic on your baby's breath. <laughs> Takes one minute for one drop of blood to go round the whole body. But you will find your baby is strong and healthy and will heal quickly. What about a fever? I never gave my baby Panadol because a fever is your friend. And three things to remember with the fever, it's your friend when all of Rubbish is burnt up, the fire will go out, and water will put the fire out. If the baby has a fever, you can put the baby in a tepid bath and the tepid water will draw the, draw the heat out of the body. Or you can wrap your baby in a wrung out wet sheet and then a little woolly blanket and cuddle your baby. They won't like the wet sheet, but once you've got the little woolly blanket on, they're comfortable. And that cold wet sheets pulls that extra heat out of the body and into the wet sheet. They might fall asleep in it, that's all right. Or you might take it off within 10 minutes and that's a very good way just to get that temperature down. The only time a baby will be in trouble with a fever is if the baby's dehydrated. So make sure the baby's having lots of breast milk, lots of water. Even at that time, I might even feed the baby a little bit more. You've got to get that fluid into the baby. I trust this lecture has enlightened you as to how to feed your babies, when to feed your babies, how to feed your toddlers, and when to feed your toddlers. Thank you for your attention, ladies. Do we have any questions? Yes, there's a microphone. My son is now eight years old, and he didn't have any skin problem until just a year later. I mean, uh, last year yeah. when he started developing some eczema yes. on his ear. And I took him to a GP and the GP said, oh, it's a common problem among children where you have split mm. or a cut just right under the ears. And it keep on popping yeah. back on. Yes. And he's vegetarian. Does he have wheat? I think he does. Yes, yeah. So notice what the GP said. It is a common problem. We've forgotten what normal is. Normal is there is no rash on the baby at all. So if, if a little, well this is not a baby, this is an eight-year-old, I would stop the wheat, stop the barley, stop the oats, stop the refined sugar and stop the dairy. In fact, I could have an answering service on my phone. Stop the wheat, all gluten, dairy and sugar. Next. <laughs> it sounds so simple. What, what do we do with the... Uh what, what do you do with the cut? Um, you could bathe it with salt water, but he won't like it. <laughs> and you could put um, just a little bit of aloe vera on it. But anything that happens in the skin is an indication of something that's happened on the inside. You heal the body from the inside, the skin will all clear up. So it, it will automatically clear and it'll clear from the inside out. Don't, don't be surprised that you might need to wait three or four weeks before it's totally healed. But keep going. Will you keep him off that? Well, maybe six months later you might try a little. See what the reaction is. Sometimes children can't cope with it for three or four years and then they can start to have a little. That's why you watch. You watch what your body responds to. But you, you have a look. Wheat is in so many things. <laughs> That's why I say become Chinese, live on rice. <laughs> Easy way to do it.